How was your mother coping with <clears throat> this whole experience of Mandela? Well, she uh, seemed to be healthy, but after we got out, I noticed she had arthritis and her left arm was kind of useless. And when, when we were at Manzana, we bought her clothes, uh, dresses that buttoned down the front so she could get into them, you know, without raising her arm. <coughs> About uh, 1940, I came back from Madison, Wisconsin, 1948. <coughs> her arm was okay, <coughs> but she had bad teeth, and we had to have had all her teeth fixed. And uh, during the camp, she she seemed to be pretty independent and doing a lot of things she wanted to do, but never said anything about how hard it was for her to have lost the store and to have to start over again. And <clears throat> since most all of us in the family had were grown up and working, we tried to get her not to work, but she wanted to keep busy, so she would go out and do you know, work like sorting walnuts in a <clears throat> small business, or I think freezing was coming in, so she would go to a place where they were <clears throat> Uh, freezing shrimp into cartons, and she would sort out the shrimp. And we tried to get her to stop that work because her hands were always in water, and it was cold water. So eventually, she did stop working, and she went to <coughs> work for the uh, Buddhist temple of which she was a member. And she was a very devout Buddhist, and she went every day to cook for the priest there. I think she enjoyed that a lot. But she never talked about what happened until many years later <clears throat> when we were talking. And she said, you know, I, the first couple of weeks we were in Manzanar, I used to walk all the way up to the orchard. And I used to sit there and cry. But after a couple of weeks, I decided that was not very productive and uh, stopped doing that. And then she started to go to work and doing you know, different things, taking care of my, grand, my nephew. Uh, even at the time when <clears throat> people were campaigning for redress in the early 80s, and we talked about it, she said, oh, yes, all those people who lost so much money and property, they really should be uh, compensated. Never thought of herself, because she lost a grocery store and uh, a future where she could have been a little bit more. Tell me know. again about where your mother went to be alone and, and why. She went up to, to, <coughs> Instead of saying she, because my question won't be heard, uh -huh. speak of my mother. My mother was, uh, I guess, we were living in Block 20, which is sort of in the middle of the camp. <coughs> the orchards were up, I would say, about half a mile toward the mountains. And my mother told me years later that she used to walk up there after we had all left after breakfast and go up to the orchard and sit there and cry. And she said she did that every day for a couple of weeks. And none of us knew that. And then, <clears throat> then she decided that that was kind of a useless thing to do. So she stopped doing that. And she looked around for things she could do in the camp. Tell me about the gardens that started to grow up, the flower gardens and the ponds. The what? The flower gardens oh. and the ponds. <clears throat> when I first got my job as a reporter for the Free Press, uh, I was assigned to go up to Block 6, which is the very end of, uh, of the camp, and do a report on a pond that had been finished. And they had a Japanese goldfish in it. And I was kind of intrigued by that. And I, evidently, they had ordered them through the catalog. And uh, it was not just a pond. They had a, a rock garden around it. And I know that when they were digging up uh, and cleaning out a lot of the gardens, they came across the garden at Block 6, which is, I think, the first garden that was built. 
And then they built another one across, which was block 12. And that was quite an elaborate one, too. But they used the materials right there that they could find, the stones, the rocks. <coughs> they bought, I guess they did uh, get cement to put those rocks into the garden, build the pond. What first inspired that, do you think? Well, ac according to an interview that we did with Harry Ueno, he said he was uh, concerned because everybody lined up for their meals outside the mess hall, and there was no shade and no place to sit. So he talked to the mess hall people and, and, the, and the men in the block, and they decided they would build this this garden. His garden was almost the full length of the barrack, the mess hall, which is 100 feet. And they got <clears throat> an order for cement. And uh, they brought in the rocks and, and put together, you know, the, I guess the yucca trees and different shrubs. Uh, he had an order for three sacks of cement, and it was not enough. So he asked that they keep the order requisition for him and not turn it in. So each time that he was finished with the three sacks, he would send someone to the warehouse and get another three sacks. And so we, <clears throat> later on, they called it the three sack garden, but it really took more than three sacks. And he's, I think his garden in Block 22 uh, won the contest for the best garden in camp. And there were, there were gardens all over the place. And I think that they wanted to really beautify the place because it was such a barren and windy place, and people wanted to be able to, uh, <coughs> you know, sit there and, and enjoy each other's company and, and not have to st sit in the hot sun or stand in the hot sun waiting for their meals. Uh, I don't know whether it was an all-camp project, but <clears throat> they did build uh, an acre of a uh, garden and pond for, they called it Pleasure Park, but eventually it was called Merritt Park for the director, Ralph Merritt. And there are still remains of that, and uh, some people would like to have that restored. But there are gardens everywhere. That must have had an effect on the mood of daily life. I think so. And the people also <clears throat> built gardens in front of their unit, or they planted uh, flowers. They had vegetable gardens. And it was a real attempt to beautify their surroundings. And I think it really helped the morale of the people. That's great. Tell me about the attitude called Shikata Ganai. Well, that was mostly <clears throat> a saying among the older generation. And I guess we kind of picked it up too, but it was like, well, it, you know, can't be helped, so you have to make the best of it. And I think the, uh, the Issei were very good at that because they had. Had, they had suffered so much even before, uh, even before the war, and I think in a way it kind of helped them to go through the period of, of being confined. Mm 